Hey everyone, my name is Dr. Dave, and uh, I'm the director of uh, outreach and education for a nonprofit organization called the Pennsylvania Society for Biomedical Research. And I usually give this presentation uh, live to students, but obviously we're in a global pandemic right now, and uh, we're stuck doing this virtually. And I'm going to try a little something different today. I'm going to have this camera pointed at me most of the time, kind of live streaming, if you will, but recorded. Uh, and I'm also going to be looking at my computer screen and recording the same stuff as I uh, tell you about the slides that I'll be showing you during my presentation. All right, but I first wanted to show you my office. Um, this is where I spend most of my time these days. I just showed you my my computer uh, on my desk. Okay. I also have a microscope on my desk, which I use to look at uh, specimens like these little fruit flies right here. And we're going to get into some of this a little bit later. Uh, over here is where I have a bunch of other specimens. So I have these cave fish from Mexico. And uh, amazingly enough, they don't have any eyes. All right. Over here I have some brine shrimp. Here I have some pond water. You can see little critters swimming around uh, in the pond water. Here I have little water fleas that you can see swimming around in there. Take a look at those a little bit later. And I also have some other fish that I got from a pet store. These are called zebra fish. Uh, you also might notice that I have a bunch of lab supplies and chemicals here. And if you turn right over here, you'll see my lab bench that contains uh, a bunch of other specimens and other uh, lab equipment that I can use in the comfort of my own home. Now I show you all that stuff in my office to encourage you or maybe inspire you to think about doing science at home while you're uh, quarantined in your home um, and not going to school as often as we normally do. Okay, so I'd like to get back to my presentation here. And the title of my presentation is What is so cool about biomedical science? And I know that you most likely have um, a sheet that you need to fill out. So I've included all my information here on this sheet. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but hopefully then your teacher can get back to these uh, answers if you want to write them down. So my name again is Dr. David Garby. You can call me Dr. Dave if you want. And uh, throughout my career, I worked most frequently or the, the majority of my time has been spent working in different biomedical research labs. Um, so therefore, the next column, my job title, I am a biomedical scientist, but I don't do that science anymore. Now I'm the director of outreach and education uh, for a nonprofit organization, again, called the Pennsylvania Society for Biomedical Research. And, but when I was a scientist, or I still am a scientist, but when I was working in the laboratory, I studied all different types of diseases, um, like cancer, um, and then mood disorders like depression and bipolar disease, and also other um, parts of our nervous system, including our behaviors, um, like why we sleep every day um, at nighttime. My most favorite thing about my job as a scientist is I got to ask tons of questions and then you get to go figure out the answer to those questions by doing experiments and coming up with hypotheses. My least favorite thing is like, like anything else, science can be hard, so you have to have a thick skin sometimes. Um, a lot of what we do, unfortunately, just doesn't work sometimes um, because the experiment didn't work technically or we didn't get the right answer, didn't support our hypothesis, and that's okay because it always leads me back to asking more questions, which again is my favorite thing. Um, to get into the science field, um, you don't really need much more to do some of the jobs than a high school diploma. Um, but if you want to advance yourself further, obviously you need more experience and more education. You could go to school to be um, to get an associate's degree at a community college. You can get a bachelor's degree uh, and do science right out of college. Um, I myself went back to school after college and went and got my uh, PhD, where I did my graduate work, and I got my doctorate degree in cell molecular biology. Um, and that was additional five and a half years after college. So after high school, I was in higher education after that for a total of, of nine and a half years. All right. So I'd like everybody to close your eyes for a moment. No more than five or 10 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna do it with you. And I want you to answer the question, what does a scientist look like to you? Okay, what are some physical 
characteristics or features of that scientist. Go ahead. All right, now open your eyes. When asked this question over and over again, most students think about the person on your screen right now, right? An old white man with crazy white hair. Um, some people think of mad scientists or crazy scientists, and I think that picture of an old white man with crazy white hair comes from the, a real scientist that we all know of, or most people know of, is Albert Einstein. But unfortunately, this is not what all scientists look like. And in fact, science crosses racial and cultural boundaries. So whether you're black, white, or, white or brown, you could become a scientist. It crosses gender boundaries. So whether you are a male or a female, you can become a scientist. Here on this image that you see on your screen right now are some of my science colleagues and friends. The man and the woman on the right-hand side, they're married. Uh, scientists can marry each other. They're, they're, they're normal people. The person on the bottom, in the middle, her name is Mira Sundaram, and she is my first science mentor out of college. She kind of put me on the path of being the scientist that I am today. And the gentleman in the bottom left-hand corner, his name's Ishmael, and he is a grad school friend of mine. Um, who is now professor of biology at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. All right, so scientists just don't have to be old white men. They can be anybody, including you. And you don't even have to wait to be an adult to be a scientist. If you're curious and you want to explore, you like asking questions, you can become a scientist as well. All right, just quickly, as I mentioned, I work for this organization called the Pennsylvania Society for Biomedical Research, or PSBR. Um, and really, we have one mission. We want to educate the public about biomedical science. All right, that's all we do. And most of what I do is going into classrooms, or I did before the global pandemic, um, but going into classrooms and providing science activities and science lessons and science education um, and career guidance to students like you. Here's my most important slide of the day. Okay, whether you believe me or not, this is it right here. These two lines of text, this says it all for me. The person that asks a question may feel like a fool for a minute. He or she who doesn't is a fool for life. Why would we say that? Well, I saw this quote actually when I was in ninth grade, only 15 years old. It was 29 years ago, and I still remember it today. And as a scientist, I love this because, as I mentioned to you just a few minutes ago, one of my favorite things to do as a scientist is ask questions. This is what scientists do best. However, this, doesn't, this just doesn't pertain to science. This pertains to everyday life. You should not be afraid. You should not feel stupid asking questions. Okay, you're not going to look like a fool. And this is the way we acquire new information. right? You should love asking questions and you should not be afraid to do this. All right. I want you to take that home with you today and think about that. Always, always, always feel comfortable asking questions. So here's a question for you. All right. What is biomedical? If you look it up in the dictionary, it says relating to biology and medicine. I'm asking this question, what is biomedical, because I am a biomedical scientist. So let's make sure we're all, we all know what we're talking about when uh, we're talking about biomedical. Well, biology means that you're working with living things. Okay, so whether you're studying humans or fruit flies or any of those animals that I showed you in my office or trees and flowers, you could be doing biomedical science. Likewise, we, when we think of medicine, we might be thinking of, of uh, things that we take or use to treat an illness or a disease, really to make us feel better. Um, so we want to understand how our bodies, how the natural biology of our bodies and living things work in order to better understand those living things because when things when those living things when those processes start to break down uh, it leads to becoming sick or having a disease so if we understand how that stuff works we can maybe better fight the diseases um, down the road so before we go on i want to show show you how this relates to you in your everyday life All right so think about how you're feeling better due to the advancements or the results of the biomedical science that has been done throughout history I mean, think about that question. Again, I would normally solicit your responses, but I can't do that. So let's think about things like Tylenol or Advil. We get a headache, we go see mom or dad or our caretaker, and we ask for Tylenol. Or maybe we have a fever and mom or dad just gives us Tylenol or Advil. That's biomedical science helping you feel better. And actually, when you really think about it, it seems like magic. 
Um, but it's just a little pill that we take that helps us feel better. Allergy medication, um, antibiotics that you get from the doctor's office or the doctor's office prescribes them and you pick them up from the local pharmacy. Chemotherapy for people studying can or for patients with cancer. We can help patients live five, 10, 20 years longer now than we used to because of these advancements in biomedical science. Okay, so whether you're uh, you know taking Tylenol or know of somebody that may be treated for cancer, this is really how biomedical science impacts every one of us. And one more thing, obviously, in this world in which we live in today, with this coronavirus and the pandemic, uh, biomedical science is is incredibly important to get us through it. Um, scientists need to figure out, um, you know, how the how the virus is is causing the illness, figure out long-term effects of this virus and what it does to our body, but also most importantly, scientists are working extremely hard at uncovering and discovering a vaccine that will help get us through and live healthier lives um, from this point forward. When thinking about jobs in this field, we can think of a variety of options, all right? First thing you gotta do is stay in school. You gotta get through high school. As I mentioned, a two or a four year degree will help you in this field, but it is not required. Um, and after you go to college or get your four year degree, there's, you can become a scientist right then and there. You can work for the government or do public advocacy, public policy work. You can become a teacher. You can become a veterinarian or, or a professional in the healthcare field like a doctor or a nurse or a dentist. Okay? All, of these, all of these jobs, um, in my mind, are classified under this field of biomedical. All right. I mentioned to you before that we're going to look at a microscope. Um, so what is a microscope? Well, it's a piece of scientific equipment that allows somebody to look at something that's really small and look at it bigger in greater detail. And I showed you the microscope that was on my desk before. All right. Here's just a few more examples. Uh, here's one that costs probably, you know, $25, $30. Here's one that costs... Um, I don't know, maybe a thousand dollars. Here's one that costs a few thousand dollars. Uh, this one here costs about five hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. It takes up an entire table. It's run by a computer, and it uses lasers to look at the specimen that you're interested in observing. Uh, this one here doesn't even have any eyepieces. It's run completely by a computer. And these two last microscopes are probably in the range of of three to four hundred thousand dollars. So you can see that. We have a lot of technology here in this field, um, and we have lots of ways to look at small specimens um, and make them super, super big. All right, so I've showed you a lot of animals in my office, and we've talked about animals that we might look at to do, to, to, to do science. Now we need to work with what we call animal models or model systems, because I'm not allowed to do an experiment on you. Uh, it's just, just against the law. It's not moral, it's not right. So in order to figure out how our bodies work and how these biology or natural organisms work, we need to look at other animals. And here are just a few examples. Worms, flies, fish, uh, mice, and non-human primates like a monkey are all used um, in the field of biomedical science. Again, you can do science at home. Here's my home office. Here's a video of, of those uh, water fleas swimming around in my fish tank see that they are uh, there's thousands of them in there All right. now they don't look like much but if you take one out and put it under a microscope this is what you see you can see that the black spot at the top right hand corner of the screen is its eye that green tube running down its inside through the middle of its body is its digestive system um, it eats green algae from my fish tank which is why it's green right now um, and if you look carefully where that arrow is pointing um, you can actually see the heart beating in this video. Uh, this video was not taken, I mean, it was not um, acquired with, with any specific high-tech equipment. It was used, I was using the microscope that's on my desk and the cell phone that I'm holding in my hand right now. Okay. Um, I also mentioned these fish that you could get from the fish store. They're called zebrafish. Um, if you put a male and a female together, they will mate with each other. And what you notice is in this video, you'll notice that these zebrafish uh, eggs are starting to grow. What you notice is that the cells uh, on top of the round circle in the middle of each of those eggs, they're dividing right in front of your eyes. Okay, what you'll notice is that originally when this loops around again, it started out as four cells. 
two that you can see, and then one in back of each of those. But as this time lapse video goes on and on and on, it goes from four cells to 512, right? So it just looped around again. Um, watch the, the, the little blobs on top of the yolk sac uh, in the middle, they're dividing, right? And this process goes on and on and on for four days um, until the fish need to hatch out of their eggs, their eggshells. So here's another time-lapse video showing these fish hatching out of its eggshell. Um, and once again, I did not use any high-tech scienti scientific equipment. I simply used my cell phone in time-lapse mode and a microscope that's sitting on my desk that you could get from Amazon or another science supply store for relatively inexpensive. All right. Um, and then you take the zebrafish out and you look at it a little bit more closely and you can even see the heart beating in this animal as well. The arrow in this video is pointing to the heart beating. All right. But these fish aren't the only thing that scientists use. I can told you that we use worms. This worm is a tiny microscopic worm. It's a nematode. It's found in the soil outside of our homes. Um, the scientific name is Cenerobditis elegans. And again, it's microscopic. It is only a millimeter big. So next to a penny, you can look at this ruler here. Think about the size of a millimeter on a ruler. It is the smallest measurement that you can see on a standard ruler. This thing is tiny. If you put it under a microscope, what you notice is this black squiggly line that you can see in the, in the middle of this plate. All right, and again, this is just with a standard microscope that you might use at home or in your classroom. However, if you use one of those microscopes that costs three to four hundred thousand dollars that I mentioned earlier, you could take that same animal, it's millimeter big, and look at it in all of the detail that you see here. Wrinkles on the skin, um, the tail. Okay. And if you're not impressed yet, and you wanna look at the mouth, I can show you that too. There is the mouth of something that is a millimeter big. In my mind, it's awesome that we can see it. Um, it's cool that it even has a mouth, but what's even cooler about this animal itself is that this worm, this tiny microscopic worm is being used to fight cancer. All right? In the right hand image there on this screen, you'll see two black arrows pointing to tumors on the outside of the animal. Um, and I was actually, was, I was able to record a, um, a video of these worms with cancer using my cell phone. So you'll notice on the top of this worm's body wall, you'll see these little bumps. Um, those are tumors because this worm has cancer. And scientists are using something that is only a millimeter big to uh, study a disease like cancer that kills 500,000 people every year. That's pretty impressive to me. All right, I wanna end here by talking about our nervous system. Um, when I mention the nervous system, or when I say the nervous system, I hope what comes to mind is your brain, your spinal cord, and all your senses, your sight, your nose, your smelling, your taste, your hearing, your touch, everything that allows us to interact with the environment outside. Um, and there's actually quite a bit of similarities between our nervous system and those of some of these animal models with which scientists work. For example, here's a picture of a real human brain next to the picture of a real mouse brain. So you can see the size comparison between our brain and a mouse. And then there's a brain there of a little tiny fruit fly, something that you might find in your kitchen um, on a hot summer day. Yes, fruit flies have brains as well, and they're used by scientists to study all types of questions involving neuroscience. Um, so here's what a fruit fly looks like under um, magnification. It's very beautiful. You can see the big red eyes, you can see the wings, you can see the stripes on its back, you can see the hairs covering its body. This is how we grow them in the lab. Um, if I can just show you quickly here, this is how I grow them at home, right? Just like you see one of these little plastic vials. You can see these fruit flies crawling up and down these tubes or vials. Um, uh, you can see the fruit fly at the top right hand corner of the, or next to the penny. Uh, and then underneath it in that black puddle of liquid are fruit fly brains. So you can see how small they are. And this is me doing the work uh, as a scientist in the lab at a microscope. And the thing I want to tell you about to end with is that fruit flies are used to study behaviors. And this is something I never did. My friends next door, my colleagues next door um, did this work. 
but you can actually use fruit flies to study behavior. Now I studied sleep, but one of the behaviors we can study is aggression or fighting. Okay, why do we fight? What causes us to get in arguments? What causes us to get into a physical altercation? Well, again, I can't do this really in humans, but I can start probing some of the underlying basic biology of these behaviors in uh, an insect like the fruit fly. So here's a video. Now you can hear my music playing. Here's a video of two fruit flies fighting each other. Isn't this amazing? Look at one of them just body slammed the other one. Now they're fighting over that, that food cup in the middle of, of the screen there. Um, and these are two male flies fighting. We know that only, we know that only male flies fight. Um, female flies will just butt heads and kind of walk away from each other. So we can learn about um, why the males are more aggressive in this species. We also know that there's a winner and a loser to every fight. So once a fly wins a fight, it is, um, it's more likely to win the next fight that it gets into. And once a fly loses a fight, it's almost guaranteed to never win another fight in its life. Um, so, you know, we can, might be able to even study something as abstract as confidence. Why does that fly um, almost always or more frequently win that next fight after winning one? Maybe it gets more confident. Um, we don't know. But uh, this is something that, that scientists hope to tease out by using something as simple as a fruit fly. So when you see this word, heroes, what do you think about? Most students, when I ask this question, think of these characters here. But I'm talking about real life heroes, okay? What about, you might be thinking about um, policemen and women, firefighters, doctors and nurses, family members, teachers, maybe the military. These are all great examples of potential heroes. There's somebody that you look up to uh, there may be somebody that even can save a life. Think about the fire person, for example, the fireman or woman. They would risk their lives to run into a burning building to save a family or to even save you if you're in a classroom full of 25 students. Um, in my mind, that is extremely heroic. Um, but what's really cool about being a scientist is that when we come up with a cure for cancer, we didn't just uh, save the lives of 25 people from a burning building which again is fantastic, but we might be able to save 500,000 people every year from dying from the disease that we know of as cancer. That is amazing, that is heroic, and that is what's really, really cool about being a scientist. But I also want you to realize that they're not the only heroes, because these animals with which we work, with which scientists work, they have to be heroes too. We wanna to know half of the things that we know about biology and about biomedical science without working with these animals. Um, so whether it's a worm, a fly, a, a, a mouse, or a monkey or a fish, these animals are well cared for, they are treated responsibly, and they are heroic in their own right as well. You may have a ton of questions at this point. I'm sorry I'm not there to answer them for you. Uh, but there's got to be another way for me to jump on a call if you have tons of questions um, that I could zoom into your classroom and maybe go through some of them with you. Uh, but the pictures you see here are just some of the pictures of the labs that, I, that I've worked in um, throughout my 16 years of doing research. I hope you enjoyed this presentation today and uh, best of luck with school. Be healthy, stay safe, and we're going to get through this. All right? Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.